Hello everybody, Pastor Matthew here, Zion Lutheran Church. Welcome back. Uh, we are now in week three uh, in our Bible study series on Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, an ancient story for a modern church, otherwise titled Return and Rebuild. Uh, we've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, this story the first two weeks that we've been doing this, kind of really trying to get an introduction uh, to what these stories are going to bring us and where they are going to go. At this point, we've kind of covered the kind of the outline of the story and what's going to happen. Uh, yes, the Israelites are going to be returning from their exile, and they are going to begin rebuilding Jerusalem uh, and everything that is important to them within that city. And so today, uh, really, we are really going to be getting a good start and a quick start into the first part of the the book of Ezra chapters 1 through 6 as you can see here this is what we're going to be working on uh, last week the homework was to read uh, these first six chapters uh, if you haven't done so already and would like to uh, you can certainly pause the video and go ahead and do that uh, as I said last time there are a few parts of that 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 are a lot of names mostly chapter 2 uh, is going to be a difficult one with lots of names and uh, that, uh, yeah, if you need to skip over that one, that's okay. If you want to give it a shot, uh, you certainly don't have to read it out loud. Um, and, and we're not going to be hearing this on a Sunday morning during uh, worship either. So uh, don't worry about those uh, those names. But uh, a lot of information uh, takes place within those first six chapters. And that's what we're going to be covering uh, in, in somewhat detail today. It's going to seem like we're going to be going through it a little bit fast uh, since last week, you know, we only spent time on the first four verses of the first chapter. Now we're going to pick up from where we left off, and we're going to do basically five and a half chapters uh, within our time that we have together. So it is going to be going by a little quick. So if you do have any questions uh, about anything that isn't covered or anything that isn't covered enough, uh, please let me know. Uh, you can always send me an email, pastormatthew at zlcbrentwood.org, and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions that you might have and have some discussion with you, especially on uh, some of the discussion questions that we'll be going through uh, today uh, as we go through the story. So uh, really what we're going to start out by doing this uh, this day is g give you a recap on what we talked about in the uh, second part, uh, in case you have forgotten, so that we can uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we'll just get right into it, uh, starting with Ezra chapter 1, verse 5. But uh, three things that I want to bring up from last time that we were able to get together for this uh, to kind of get us in the mindset of where we are going today. Uh, the first one was Jeremiah's prophecy. If you go back and you read Ezra, uh, one, uh, the first chapter of Ezra, verse 1, uh, we know it says, In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And so we start off with a very odd introduction with some names that we just don't understand. And Jeremiah is one of the ones that comes up uh, really quickly. And just to take us through uh, um, just a little bit of what Jeremiah was talking about. Jeremiah, of course, was a, an Israelite priest in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, and he was a prophet of God, one of the big uh, prophets uh, that we know of. And he was called to warn the people for uh, breaking their covenant of God. And basically... Uh, he was telling them, stop what you're doing. Uh, what you're doing is evil on the side of the Lord. And if you continue to do it, God's going to come in. Uh, and he's going to bring in an army that will conquer you and take you off uh, into exile. Uh, he used an imagery of a cup of wrath, God's cup of wrath. And God wanted him to uh, make the nations uh, drink it that God would be taking into exile. And so <clears throat> that's what Jeremiah's mission was, was to take that word uh, from God and give it to Israel, uh, specifically the southern kingdom here, uh, who is going to be carried away uh, into exile. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Jeremiah, along with them, uh, went uh, to Babylon uh, when Babylon came in and conquered the southern kingdom. Uh, but we also remember uh, that the, the bad news was that, that was not all that Jeremiah brought. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But Jeremiah's prophecy was uh, that they would be taken off into exile, uh, but that there would be a hope for a return. All right? And so now the second thing on our list was King Cyrus. King Cyrus is our first indicator of this hope of return. 
Uh, and you might ask, why is this? Well, uh, this is because we know Jeremiah was talking about that Babylon was going to be coming in, that, that uh, big nation of Babylon was going to come in and take um, uh, the Israelites away into captivity. And so Israel's in captivity in Babylon. The fact that we have King Cyrus in the beginning chapter of this book reminds us now that uh, King Cyrus was not a king of Babylon. He was a king of Persia. And part of the end of Jeremiah's prophecy was that even though Babylon would come in and conquer Israel, uh, somebody else would come in and conquer Babylon. Uh, that large nation of Babylon, someone's going to come in and take over. And that, of course, was the Persians. And so when we see King Cyrus coming up in the first verse, what that's going to do for a lot of people who are reading this book, uh, particularly trying to remember that heritage in that time, is to say, oh yes, okay, this is good. Babylon is gone. Somebody else is in control, which means there's now a glimmer of hope uh, for a return because uh, Jeremiah's words are coming to fruition here. And then this number three here, this hope of fulfillment. So now we, we've gotten that a little bit of that hope so far already. Uh, and so we have hope that's created within the people, uh, the people who were living at this time, who were going to be starting to return. And then anybody who would be reading this after the fact, uh, remembering that God's word is true, it's trustworthy. And so this hope uh, that people are gathering from this is, one, uh, the future uh, that brings in the hope of a messianic king. Uh, we might get that from uh, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Hosea. Uh, there is a hope for a future Messiah uh, because of what's taking place. Uh, we have the hope of God's presence in a new temple. Uh, and the temple is what we're going to specifically be talking about today, but uh, that there is a hope that God's presence would come back uh, to a temple that is rebuilt. All right, And so that's another piece of hope people were looking at. Uh, a third piece of hope is that uh, God's kingdom would be restored and it would, it would be over all the nations. Uh, that God's kingdom was coming in such a way uh, that, it would now, that it would come with power and might and that it would be above uh, any other kingdom, uh, which may uh, prove to be a little, um, uh, little bad news for other people. Um, but as people were kind of hoping for this, what they're eventually going to discover is that that new kingdom is not going to be an earthly kingdom. Uh, it's going to be a heavenly kingdom, but they don't know that yet. So spoiler alert, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, the fourth piece of hope that we might get out of, uh, out of this is that it's all going back. Uh, we're all being reminded back to God's promise to Abraham, which comes all the way back from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12 is where we first encounter Abraham and God together. Uh, and this promise of land, uh, of, uh, of, a, uh, of a legacy, a family legacy, uh, and God's blessing. So that's what we're thinking of as well when we're coming back to that hope. Oh yeah, God hasn't forgotten about us. Uh, God is still thinking about us. God is going to bring us back. God is still in control. And so those are the three things that are kind of uh, getting us ready uh, to go into this first part of this uh, three uh, kind of three stories that we're going to be going through here, uh, specifically talking about the first one uh, today. You know, last time I was talking about a um, comparing it to the Star Wars stories, of course, because yeah, I just I have to bring in a Star Wars reference every now and again. Um, and so this uh, one that we're going to be talking about today would be Ezra chapters 1 through 6, A Zerubbabel Hope, uh, looking at uh, a new story, uh, a new beginning, and the chance that we're going to be moving forward to something great, uh, coming from something that has just kind of dissipated uh, and not gone the way we wanted it to. And so that's what we're going to be starting in today as we uh, begin chapter 1, uh, verse 5 of uh, the book of Ezra. So let's go ahead and get that started. Uh, we're going to read some verses here, uh, and then we'll talk about them. We're just going to kind of go right through the story. Uh, and I'll bring up some points as we go. Uh, and then uh, I'll ask some questions. Uh, and I, I encourage you to be thinking about those questions and what they might mean for you and for, uh, for our coming back to uh, what our rebuilding and returning might look like, especially in this time of pandemic. So Ezra chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 5, uh, says, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites. Now, wait a minute, I should say this. Um, remember, 
the end, uh, the first four verses, uh, King Cyrus is making a uh, decree, um, uh, talking about the, the, the return of Israel to Jerusalem. And so that's what we're talking about here. Uh, let me start over. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them. Now, these are their Babylonian neighbors. Uh, with article or Persian neighbors, I guess at this point, I'm sorry, uh, with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. And so yeah, I want to keep going here, but uh, just something that just kind of came up. Uh, so everybody around the, around the Israelites, whether they have an, uh, an Israelite past or not, uh, they're giving them items to go on their way uh, when they go back to uh, Jerusalem. And this is kind of reminiscent of what happened in the story of the Exodus, a part that we may not think of, uh, that when Moses was leading the people out uh, toward the Red Sea, before they left, uh, the people, the Egyptians there, were compelled to help them and give them uh, a, lot of, a lot of their wealth uh, as they went on their way. That's one thing we, we don't often uh, think about in that story of the Exodus. And so this is, this is kind of uh, taking us back to that story when we hear this in Ezra. And so the people are thinking, uh, as they read this, as they listen to this, oh, a new, uh, kind of a new exodus. Uh, moving on to verse 7. Uh, Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory. Gold dishes, 30. Silver dishes, 1,000. Silver pans, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Matching silver bowls, 410. Other articles, 1,000. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these, along with the exiles, when they came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And so that's what's going on right now. So this is 70 years after they first started going into, let me bring it back to me here so you're not staring at words, uh, 70 years after the people had started been taken uh, now to Babylon. Um, <clears throat> and we're thinking about that, okay, 70 years, thinking back to this time period, most of the people who, uh, who were carried off uh, were no longer alive. And so this was a new generation of people uh, the people that are returning, for the most part, are people that were born in captivity. They were born in Babylon, which is now Persia. And so they've adapted to uh, what life is like uh, being uh, in that area. And so now there has to be a very powerful movement from God to want to go back and rebuild. Uh, because, I mean, this was the life that they knew. They, other than the stories that they heard from their parents and grandparents, they never knew anything of what life was like uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem. They, they did not know it themselves. And uh, try to get somebody to go back from where they are uh, into a life like that, that's rather difficult to do. Um, and so not everybody came back. Uh, there were, there was, as scripture says, it's only a remnant uh, that came back. Um, and as we talked about, they, uh, the, the people that were there who may not have been uh, Israelite at all or who may have been and just wanted to uh, help the people who were going, they gave them money and gifts to go back with. Um, and, and we're getting these parallels with other books in, in, in Scripture, uh, much like a new Exodus. Uh, in fact, there's so many other parallels in this book uh, to the book of Exodus, but we're not going to cover uh, all of them. And so there are, yeah, there, there are people that are going back, a remnant, um, that have been moved by God. That's really the only way that they would be able to do this, is to be moved by God to go back, just as Cyrus was moved by God uh, to allow them uh, to go back. And um, one, one of the other parallels to Exodus that we're going to get at the end of uh, Ezra chapter 6 uh, is that this particular story ends with the celebration of Passover. It ends with a big feast, which is, I mean, basically the reenactment of, of, of Exodus and how that story 
uh, is, is kind of held in foundation uh, coming from that story of Passover. Um, and so it's almost like a reenactment of Exodus in a way. And so it's kind of messing with our minds as we go through it. Um, and it's making us think like, think like the prophets. We think in patterns. Um, you know, we know, we know the old uh, saying that, you know, history repeats itself. Uh, in this way, it's kind of a good thing, but in, in other ways, what that phrase is kind of telling us is, you know, watch out, because uh, we can get too, uh, too uh, stuck up in our own ways uh, to not realize that we're going to be our own downfall one day. Um, and so we're kind of looking at this in a way, and we can see our own lives uh, as another chapter of this biblical drama. Uh, we can see images of Exodus even in our own lives. Um, we can see images of exile in our own lives here too, kind of being away from the church. Uh, as well. And so what God does, uh, what he does, when God does what he does here, uh, we can see he's often con confronting something uh, that's within ourselves, uh, that kind of that sinful nature uh, and his uh, sovereign justice uh, throughout all of this. And so we are part of this story as well. Uh, we get to be now part of a new exodus, not only as we read this, but also as we uh, live through this pandemic and we prepare to uh, kind of go back uh, to what the church is, is going to be and to, to kind of rebuild it in a new different way. Uh, so as I said, yeah, God is not only uh, stirring the heart of the Persian king uh, Cyrus, but also the exiles uh, that, that they want to go back. Uh, and it's faith. It really takes faith um, to do this. And, and more so, not just because of, of what I was saying, uh, that these people had never been uh, in that culture before or in that land before. They, they knew nothing of it. But more uh, historically, um, really to this point, no other nation uh, that has been conquered before has ever returned to its native land uh, after such a clean break from it. Uh, no other nation has uh, been conquered and destroyed like the, uh, the Israel nation, Israelite nation, and then known to come back and rebuild and become uh, kind of a, a power uh, in this way. Now, of course, uh, Israel uh, would remain under uh, the Persian Empire uh, and then eventually the Greek and then the Roman uh, Empire. They really would never be their own nation again uh, on their own, so to speak, uh, until much later when uh, they be, well, well, we don't need to talk about that. Um, that's beside the point. But yeah, no other nation has really come back to their, their central hub and kind of rebuilt in this way, um, at least that I was able to, to read from. And so how could they have been motivated such uh, to rebuild knowing this? Uh, to, to know that as you're going back, first of all, you have no idea where you're going uh, and no idea what it means. Oh, maybe you know what it means, but you, you've never seen it in person. And now also to know that history is not on your side. Uh, history tells you that you're not going to succeed in doing this. You're not going to be able to, to do this. Um, how do you have that faith uh, to go back and to do something uh, so new and so different? And so Cyrus is letting the people go back. Uh, and we might think that besides God compelling him to, to lead him to this, uh, he's letting people go back because he thinks it's going to be advantageous for his empire. I mean, of course. Uh, if people are needing some help in Jerusalem, if Jerusalem is not uh, growing back the way uh, that he might have wanted it to, it's kind of unstable, uh, there are people there that are frustrated with how things are going, uh, what better may way to make things more stable uh, within his own empire than to let people go back and rebuild it? Uh, that way the people are going to feel better, and if you have good and happy people, that means you're going to get tax money. Uh, and as a king, you want your taxes, and so you want happy people to give you happy taxes. Um, and so we read in this uh, that Sheshbazar uh, is kind of our main character here. Uh, Zerubbabel is, is another big one, and Jeshua. Uh, they're appointed to lead this group back to Israel. Um, <clears throat> and so we're going to be getting, uh, getting to that. Ezra chapter 2, uh, if we get into that, we're not going to cover it. Uh, within, uh, we're not going to read it. I'm not going to read it. Uh, that would just, in some ways, that would be a train wreck because some, even some of those names I can't pronounce. Uh, but what's happening in chapter two, uh, this is kind of the visual of it. And I showed this map last time, but we're going to talk about it again. So we look at the, uh, uh, the different colors here, um, which will kind of show that, that they are returning from the area in the east, uh, which is Babylon or now Persia, 
uh, Susa would now be the uh, the capital of the the, the Persian capital, uh, and so they're going to make their way westward and head back down into to uh, Jerusalem. And again, this is uh, Sheshbazar, Zerubbabel, and uh, Jeshua, uh, who are doing this leading. And yes, there are a lot of names within Ezra chapter two. Uh, it's basically all names, a little bit of numbers uh, as we get through there. Uh, and so we're going to kind of skip over that and move into Ezra chapter 3. And uh, we'll start with uh, reading just the first three verses of this. And so now we're, we have to imagine we are back uh, in Jerusalem and we are ready to move on uh, with what's going to happen here. And so we have verse 1, which says, When the seventh month came... And the Israelites had settled in their towns. The people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, we'll get into that in a bit, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. And so they, they're now back in Jerusalem. How do they uh, discover now who they are? How do they uh, discover who they are? How do they rebuild their identity of who they are? And so the first thing they do, we see here, um, in their attempts to rebuild the temple is they rebuild the altar. Uh, it's the first thing they do. I mean, the altar is kind of their centerpiece, the centerpiece of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the temple, uh, aside from, you know, the Holy of Holies. Uh, but the altar is the place where they bring their, their tokens of gratefulness to God. They bring their sacrifices, uh, sacrifices for sin. They bring their sacrifice of their offering sacrifices. There are a number of different sacrifices uh, that we can, you know, we can read from in uh, the book of Levit uh, Leviticus uh, to talk about what those different sacrifices might be. Uh, but they all, for the most part, take place on this altar. Uh, and so the altar is kind of representative of where sins are covered. Uh, sacrifices have now not been used by these people in years. I mean, they, they couldn't do it. Uh, they couldn't uh, exercise their, their religion, their faith, while they were in exile. And so having come back from that now in Jerusalem, uh, this is the first time they've been able to make sacrifices. And in some cases, uh, those people who had never been here before, this is the first time uh, they've ever participated in something like this. Uh, now, they may have seen uh, similar rituals done by the various uh, false religions that were taking place in Babylon and Persia, uh, but never have they participated uh, in rituals like this with, uh, you know, for their own god. And so now the connection uh, between God and the people, that's the connection we're restoring uh, within uh, this first story, is that connection between God and the people. And so God meets uh, the people uh, through their altar uh, of sacrifice. Um, God also uh, meets us at the altar. Uh, we think about uh, how our prayers ascend from the altar to God's throne. We think about how uh, the altar, at least in our understanding, that's the place where uh, Christ's sacrifice uh, is prepared um, and where we receive uh, that once-for-all sacrifice. So we, meet, we also meet God at the altar. And so this is the first thing that uh, the Jewish people built uh, when they came back. Uh, and so like I said, yeah, when they were away from Jerusalem, uh, they didn't offer sacrifices. And so they were in a way, uh, you might even think, fasting. Uh, from doing so, whether it was by choice or uh, by situation, uh, that they weren't able to do that because, well, they could only do it in Jerusalem. The sacrifices they made uh, were only made uh, in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And so instead of being able to go uh, to their temple to sacrifice and worship, they were surrounded by these many pagan temples and altars and rituals. Um, and uh, whether they you know, shifted their religion and, and started practicing these, uh, that's a story for another time, uh, but now they're coming back and they're able to make those sacrifices theirself, themselves. So it was very different for them. And so the first thing they, they do upon coming back is to offer sacrifices to reinitiate that relationship with God. Now, think about how this might resemble us. 
uh, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, being not able to participate in uh, Holy Communion. Does that sound uh, maybe a little bit familiar? The, the Israelites were not able to participate in sacrifices, uh, and it, sometimes it feels like we're not able to participate in the sacrifice of Christ um, with, uh, on our altar and uh, within worship. Um, and, and while there's only a few connections there, I mean, it, just a, a connection of thought, uh, not really a connection uh, theologically uh, with this, uh, because, I mean, communion is something that we participate in, uh, as the scriptures say, as often as we do it uh, in remembrance of him. So it's not, it's not something that uh, we do uh, necessary for salvation. Um, <clears throat> but the, the laws of Moses uh, in the Old Testament, sacrifice was a part of uh, becoming holy uh, before God. It was part of your becoming righteous in God's sight, was to make these sacrifices to basically atone for your sins. Uh, in some ways and so that was that was a major part and requirement of their faith uh, so yeah there's only a little bit of connection there but we might be able to it, it might come to mind uh, as we go through this and so already though we're seeing uh, something going on um, as we read and I said we'd come to it they they built the altar uh, but it says there was uh, some fear uh, let me bring it back to the end of this. Uh, verse 3, despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar. And so we're already getting a sense that something's not right. Uh, something, something is looming there in the background. Um, the fear of the people around them. And that's going to come up. We're going to hear more about them in chapter 4 and what's coming. Uh, but opposition is lingering. Uh, now as we begin uh, as we begin to rebuild uh, very good uh, we're going to move on chapter uh, chapter 3 uh, verses 4 through 6 now and we will uh, see where we uh, get going from here uh, so starting at verse 4 then in accordance with what is written they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day after that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. And so, yeah, so they haven't really started uh, rebuilding the temple, but they're still, they're working primarily on their, that relationship with God. Uh, and rebuilding uh, the altar. And kind of what they're doing is we can see by uh, they're starting to get back into the habit of their worship, right? Bring it back to me. They're getting back into the patterns of, of worship. And it's like they're celebrating, they're, they're not set, they're, they're celebrating different festivals, but they're kind of resetting up their liturgical calendar. Um, and the liturgical calendar is kind of what reminds us, uh, reminds them of the story that they're living in. And after that, then they will start laying the foundation of the, of the temple with different, uh, with different, a whole bunch of different people um, helping them do it. And so as they begin to make this uh, shift back into the liturgical calendar, this is uh, kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. And so here is a, uh, an image of the Jewish calendar. And you'll see some of these, these terms we've already kind of talked about. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, I think we've talked about that. Uh, some of these terms that we do know, I mean, Hanukkah is over there. Uh, Han um, Hanukkah wasn't really a, a festival at this point of time in history. Um, Purim uh, was probably just coming around. That comes up, uh, that festival starts up uh, because of the Book of Esther. Uh, but we know Passover, uh, we know uh, the Festival of Weeks or Pentecost. And uh, kind of like the Jewish uh, New Year, kind of close to the bottom there with the Festival of Trumpets Atonement, um, <clears throat> and therefore. And so they're kind of recreating and getting back into the pattern of worship and what their, uh, what their life with God is like. And this is rather similar to our liturgical calendar as well, as we can see here. I apologize if the print is just a little small, uh, but this is our liturgical calendar that we follow. Uh, it's a pattern, uh, much like is our, our worship service in general. It's a pattern. Uh, we follow kind of the same uh, ritual each time we worship. We, we kind of have an idea of what's coming and where it's coming. We could almost worship without a bulletin for the most part because 
we know, okay, well, after the prayer of the day, we're going to have the readings. Oh, after the sermon, we're going to have a hymn and then maybe say the creed after that. We kind of know what's coming and where it's going to be in the order of how things work. Um, and this is not by, this is certainly not a mistake uh, as we think about this. But look at our liturgical calendar, how we move from one part of the year uh, to the next, you know, starting uh, in Advent as we uh, remember. Uh, Advent is kind of the transitionary, transitionary period uh, where we kind of begin preparing for the birth of Jesus. Uh, Christmas gets us into his birth, uh, Epiphany, how he reveals God's mission, uh, God's light and hope uh, to the world. Lent, we follow him to the cross. Uh, Easter, we of course celebrate his resurrection. Pentecost, then we kind of begin to look at the works of the church. Uh, ordinary time is what we call it. So we're not focusing on any particular part of the life of Jesus, but the life of the church uh, as we move through those long summer green days um, all, all the way up until uh, we get to uh, Christ the King and then back into Advent. But by that time, we've gone through the church year. The hope of Advent now becomes not just looking for the birth of Christ, but for the coming again of Christ. And so then we go through the whole cycle uh, again. It's a pattern. And so Israel now is <clears throat> rebuilding themselves upon the patterns of their worship, of their relationship with God. And so the wisdom here is that if we now are covenant people, uh, we need strategies for helping us remember who we are, uh, remember whose we are. Why did God do what he did for us? Uh, how do we maintain that identity in the midst of a world uh, with, that has their own identities? Uh, patterns. These liturgical patterns that we have are very much helpful in rem reminding us who we are. Uh, and so we focus on these rhythms of, of worship, of gathering, uh, gratefulness, offerings, uh, our calendar, our worship. I mean, this is, this is, not, um, this is not an innovative thing. I mean, we can be, we, we're certainly innovative in the ways that we do these things, um, but remembering that we have patterns is important, uh, that we gather regularly is important. Difficult now, of course, but important. Uh, there is wisdom here that makes us think creatively uh, moving forward as a people of God. One way of getting in the way uh, of revival in this case is to not have patterns that are retelling the story. When we fail to repeat the story, when we fail to talk about it, when it fails to be on our lips all the time, uh, then it's rather hard to rebuild uh, and to return. Uh, when we lack those patterns, it becomes tough. Uh, the most faithful moments that we have are when we are with people who follow Jesus and are doing this together. Um, if you are familiar and um, familiar with worship and, and what it's like to be together uh, and to sing and to pray and to, to read together, uh, you know how important that is and maybe even more so now as we're not able to do it. Uh, it reminds us of who we are. Patterns are important and so facilitating these rhythms uh, well can be challenging especially now uh, but I hope we all can agree that these rhythms play a very crucial role in uh, our identity and who we are. And so the people now in Israel they come back and they reinstitute these rhythms. Very important uh, when they're coming back. And so after this, uh, they start the rebuilding process on the uh, temple itself uh, in verses 7 through 13. We'll go ahead and read a few there. Uh, it says, Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. There's Cyrus again. In the second month of the second year, after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, so they've been there a while now, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and Levites, and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, uh, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad, and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments, 
in and with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. David, we know that name. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. That's a repetition of, uh, I think, Psalm 136, if I can remember correctly. Uh, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people had made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. And so things are looking good. Uh, everything seems to be getting built back up. Uh, but then the foundation of the temple is laid and it looks, uh, it, it basically, it looks nothing like it used to. And so the people who knew what it used to look like uh, who had seen the former temple, they're starting to get upset. Uh, they're, they're starting to not really in, enjoy what it's looking like. It's not going to be like it was in the old days. It's not looking like it was. We didn't used to do it this way. We know what we're talking about, don't we, Lutherans? Uh, we, don't, we don't understand why it's being done this way. And so they're getting upset. And other people yet are shouting with joy. It looks great. Uh, we're making progress. We're starting something new. Um, and so we got joy in the midst of weeping, and it was hard to distinguish it because they were so loud and it could be heard far away. Um, and now furthermore, uh, we'll see God's presence doesn't really kind of descend in this place in such a powerful way as it had uh, back when the, uh, the tabernacle was built during, the, during that dedication, uh, nor in uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 at the dedication of the temple. And so things are, things are good. We're starting progress, uh, but it's it's good, but it's not so good. And it's kind of about to get a little bit worse. Um, because as we know, when we're driving in traffic, we can expect some delays. And so we're going to be expecting some delays now as we move into Ezra chapter 4. And so this is going to be the first time that we really talk about those who are against and opposed to this rebuilding. Ezra chapter 4 verse 1 says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of uh, Esharhadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. <clears throat> but Zerubbabel, uh, Joshua, actually, I'm going to stop here. Let's go back to just those first two verses. There's a lot going on there. Uh, references to uh, Assyria, which was basically the big head honcho nation before Babylon. They took the northern kingdom, Babylon took the southern kingdom, and then Babylon grew and took over Assyria. Uh, but anyway, so this is the first time that we hear these enemies. And the first thing they say is basically, hey, we want to help. Um, can we help you? Uh, we worship your God too. Uh, we've been here sacrificing for a long time. Even though the temple wasn't here, we've been we've been doing this. We've been here since Assyria uh, took captives uh, from the north, um, and so the people uh, the people either had remained there or some of them had been sent here from the northern kingdom. Uh, there are people that uh, did not go into exile, and so they've been here and they, along with other uh, other gods that they worship from the people who uh, were sent uh, to live there from those conquering nations. Uh, they now, uh, they want to help. And they, they say they worship Yahweh too. And so, um, yeah, and so that's who these people are. Uh, they want to help, and yet they are, they're, they're labeled as enemies. They're labeled as enemies, as, as, as the first time we really hear about them. Um, why? Why is that? That's a good question. Um, okay, verse, uh, verse 3. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. That was their answer to, We want to help. You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Well, they kind of got that right. That's, that's what he said. Uh, then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. We'll talk about that. There's a little bit of time there. So basically, uh, these people, 
come in and they say they want to help, uh, but Zerubbabel cuts right in their face and says, we have nothing in common with you. Uh, you're not part of us. Uh, we're the ones that were taken away. We were the ones that were given the keys here to come back and do this. We're going to build it on our own. Uh, this is our tradition that we're, we're trying to, to get back here. And uh, yes, in a way, uh, but most of them having not come from this tradition in the first place, well, okay, we'll, we'll think about that. So there's conflict. Essentially, there's conflict. How are we supposed to read this? Um, I mean, yes, Cyrus did tell uh, these particular people uh, in Persia to come and rebuild. He didn't tell the natives to rebuild it. Uh, and so in a way, they are just following orders. Uh, and so they meet these polytheists, uh, those who basically worship false gods, and they tell them no. And so we get this conflict. Outsiders. How do we come off to outsiders? That's a good question for us as we think about uh, us uh, within the church now uh, in a very, uh, in a very, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? I mean, there are so many cultures uh, within our society today that uh, we kind of wonder, we have to ask the question, absolutely have to, how, have to ask it. How do we come off to somebody who's um, not really been part of a church before? Um, who or who may have been in the past, uh, who has different ideas and who wants to help. Um, <clears throat> do we just turn them away like Zerubbabel does? Um, and I'm not just talking about going up to them in their face and just saying, no, you have no part with us, go away, we don't want you here. But uh, not, also, not just in our words, but in our actions um, and how we present ourselves. Do we just turn them away? Um, how, do we, how do we handle... Uh, outsiders in the church? That's a good question. Um, how should we and how do we end up doing it and why? Um, think about that and, and certainly you can send me an email and answer that question. Let's, to, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, later in chapter 5 we're going to find out um, a little bit of what's going on with the prophets who are uh, prophesying at this time um, and, and learn a little bit and what we're going to find out here is uh, that there's a prophet, Zechariah, uh, who we're all, also might be in contentious uh, contention uh, with. <clears throat> so this, this conflict is all rather odd, uh, because we're going to hear from him, uh, who lived during this time, who was prophesying during this time of the rebuild, uh, that many people were to come together to, rebu to rebuild this and participate uh, in the worship of God. Here, I'll, I'll show you Zechariah chapter 2. Uh, so this is Zechariah. He's a prophet during this time, as I said, and this is what he says. Shout and be glad, daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. And so we have this prophecy for return, uh, for rebuild, and for hope. Uh, many will come to join the Lord, join into the Lord and become God's people, become God's people. And so we're, we might even be thinking of these enemies, as they're called already, um, who uh, have adopted other practices but still say they worship uh, the God of Israel, Yahweh, and we, we think, okay, the, the prophecies are saying that many people are going to come together um, and become God's people. And it might make us think, is this just a missed opportunity? Um, did they create unnecessary enemies? If we read Ezra and Nehemiah uh, on their own without other knowledge, we think uh, the bad guys are just bad guys. I mean, they're introduced as, uh, as uh, enemies, so they must be enemies. But if we read this in light of, uh, of other prophecies like Zechariah here, we see that, well, they might not be so bad, and it might have actually been uh, God's will for them to help. So who was right in all of this? Um, it's hard to know what their motives were. I mean, yes, it could have been dangerous to have them help. Uh, maybe their pagan worship would come into play and kind of overpower it. Or maybe it was a genuine opportunity to uh, convert people and, and share with them the, the good news of the God of Israel. And so how do, how do we take this? I mean, how do we relate to our own neighbors? Um, do we believe at heart that they have good intentions or evil intentions? Um, sometimes it's really hard to assume 
intentions. Uh, but this right here in Ezra chapter 4 and 5, I mean, this is basically a case study in all of this. And it makes us wonder, was this a missed opportunity? Um, and it might make us wonder as we think about return and rebuild, as we think about, you know, a strategic plan, a new vision. Um, what are opportunities that are going to be presented to us or may have already be, been presented to us that could be an opportunity? Uh, and, and yet we might automatically assume that there's evil intent and just kind of show them away just like uh, Zerubbabel did with of course I mean there there was good reason for them to do that like I said the natives weren't instructed to help them um, but it's something to think about and so if these people have innocent motives and if we think that the the author of these two books here are really uh, trying to make us think uh, why do they get introduced as enemies in the first place I mean, doesn't that automatically lead us as readers to view them as being enemies? Um, and thus, wouldn't that be the intent? Um, one way of thinking about this is to say that, well, we need to distinguish them as a set of characters that uh, are in opposition to what, uh, what these exile, the return from exiles, are supposed to be doing. And so the only way to do that is to call them enemies because they're the ones opposed to the building. And so we start evaluating from the, them from the beginning as basically just opposition. Um, another road, uh, which we're kind of going down, is uh, kind of a neutral introduction. Okay, yes, they're as they're called enemies. Uh, we've already heard them referred to as uh, what the people in the area. I think uh, go back and, and we'll remember what that is. Uh, yeah, but in, in chapter four here, we also know them uh, as the, the people of the land. Uh, and it can refer to non-Israelites, but it can also mean uh, Israelites who were not exiled. It could mean a whole lot of people. I mean, the land was not completely emptied of, uh, of Israelites, and there are a lot of other people who uh, practice other religions here in this time, too. So, and we know that not everybody came back. So we have really a cultural melting pot of people here. Um, and everybody here is going to have a difficult time getting along, as we now see. So how do we interpret uh, who they are. Uh, we could say that they had ill motives, uh, you could say it was a missed opportunity, or you could say it's just really hard to tell sometimes. You ask a, a church leader uh, about distinguishing between ill uh, motives and missed opportunities, it, there's a lot of conflict there. It's hard to really tell. It's a genuine ambiguity right here, uh, and it, it makes us really uh, grapple with this, uh, makes us uh, want to understand this is a question that all of God's people are going to continue to, to think about, uh, even for us today. Uh, this is something that we are supposed to ask ourselves about as we move forward. We see that there's not really a good answer here. We know what uh, Zerubbabel did, but we also know what he could have done and maybe how we would have responded. Um, but again, yeah, we don't know. Um, toward the end of chapter 4 here, uh, verses 7 through uh, 16 and on, onward to, to the, the end of the chapter, uh, we're, we see a few things. And I'm going to be closing this out and kind of going really quickly through the rest of these uh, couple chapters here. Um, we see this uh, that a new king uh, is going to be coming into play here. We remember at the end of chapter 4, I'll bring this back for you, um, that last verse, they, they bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia, down to the reign of Darius, uh, king of Persia. And so we have a few different kings going on, um, and there is actually, uh, there might be a few more in between, at least one uh, in between that. And so a new king actually comes in after King Cyrus, and so now we're uh, somewhere between the years 464, 424 BC, and uh, there are people that are now spying on what's going on in Jerusalem as part of this conspiracy against them, uh, and they're saying that... Um, <clears throat> There's, uh, of course, some building uh, still going on, um, even though, uh, you know, there, there's this opposition to it. And so a letter comes before the king. Uh, this would be King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes uh, warning him of what's taking place here and basically saying that the people are rebuilding here. Um, they're they're going to overpower you. They're never going to pay you taxes. As soon as they get this built, they're going to live in their own and basically just kind of seal themselves off as their own city. Uh, so it's about money and power in a way. And so 
and that was the the basis of that letter to King Artaxerxes. Um, <clears throat> and so, what does the king do? He writes back and he says, "Stop the building. I I don't want them to be on their own. I want my tax money. Uh, so stop the building right now. Um, we're not going to do anything with it." So the temple building really stops before it even really gets moving. Uh, and this is, this is of course, over several years. Uh, Ezra chapter 5, uh, we get this new king, and that's where D King Darius comes in. And so what happens here, by this point, uh, the people who had come to uh, rebuild the temple in the first place, uh, you know, um, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and uh, Sheshbazar, uh, we get we get at least two of those names plus Zechariah and Haggai, two prophets during this time. They basically started rebuilding on the temple on their own. They just say, "Forget it. Uh, we're we don't care what you say. Uh, we've come here to rebuild it, and we're going to rebuild this thing." So when the governors of that area, these Persian governors, want to complain to their king, um, they they do so because of course they don't want them to rebuild it, and they tell. Uh, they basically tell the king that these four um, have found the the edict. Uh, that, no, they haven't found it. They're asking the king to uh, search their archives uh, for the edict that King Cyrus wrote about back in chapter 1. If you can find this, they're saying that there's proof that they, it should be rebuilt. And so that's what's going on in chapter 6, the final chapter in this story. Uh, we, get, uh, we get King Darius getting the word. Uh, from the governors that uh, that there's, there's something in the archives that he needs to look for. And so he searches, and imagine that this is exactly what they come up with. Um, and, and he reads exactly what King Cyrus instructed the people to do uh, for what Zerubbabel is led to do to rebuild the temple. <clears throat> and so what does Darius do? He just lets them rebuild. He says, you can't stop them. Uh, we're even going to give you, we're going to give you gifts, we're going to pay you. you. You need to keep rebuilding this because that's what was said. And so the end of the chapter, uh, the chapter ends with the completion of the temple, uh, the dedication of the temple, uh, and then the celebration of Passover, which again, that uh, re uh, reminiscent back to the book of Exodus. Uh, again, thinking about those rhythms we were talking about as well. And so to dedicate the temple at the end of this section, they offer, they offer many sacrifices. Uh, they celebrate Passover. It seems like a very happy ending. Things have gone very well. Um, and yet there's this little blemish in the background of not letting those others help them build. You know, they're, they're thinking of the prophecy of hope uh, that comes from the new, king, comes, uh, yeah, from the new kingdom, um, and yet they have to think about uh, those who they have sent away, those who have expressed interest in helping, those who are you know, slightly different from who they are. Uh, they were not included, and so they were pushed aside. And so, you know, that, 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 that's going on in the back of our mind as we read it, too. Uh, when God's people are rebuilding, uh, whether it be in Ezra and Nehemiah, whether it be right now uh, in the 21st century, we should be asking questions. Uh, we should be questioning how tight uh, do we keep these boundaries, how loose uh, do we keep these boundaries, as well as the unintended consequences that can come from either scenario. Uh, like we talked about, both sides had good and valid points. Um, and so how do you judge? Uh, within this. Um, and, and maybe it's not that there's a, a definitive answer, but it's more that we really need to be thinking about the question um, <clears throat> and what faith needs to come from that. So the, as I said, the story ends with some good news, uh, but with a lot of uncertainty. Um, kind of just, you know, going back to my Star Wars reference again, uh, A New Hope. Uh, yeah, it ends with a massive threat being taken care of and, and, and the good guys winning, but I mean, the main antagonist is still out there. And it's really in your mind after everything is said and done, well, what happens? Um, what, what, what's happening now? How could that have ended differently that might have uh, taken care of that antagonist? Of course, we know that there's another story after that. Um, and just with that, there's another story after this. Now, that the same antagonist here, the antagonist in, in this story, the opposition here, is not going to be the same uh, antagonist in the next story. Uh, which is where it kind of differs from Star Wars, but um, just a way to bring in a good Star Wars reference here. And so we're going to hear of another antagonist next time. And so these are the questions we have at the end of the story, and they're questions that we can now ask in the midst of ours. Uh, what can we learn from this? Uh, there are people outside of the church 
who will be seeking to come in. Uh, do we let them? And, and I'm not talking about do we just let them in the doors to come to worship. Uh, of course we would do that, but do we let them uh, become one of us? Do we let them participate as we do, uh, despite our differences? Um, do we make it difficult? Uh, do we turn them away, not necessarily by words, but maybe by actions too, or by, uh, by policies or, or documentation? Uh, do we turn them away saying, you have no part with us, we have nothing in common, um, you don't agree to what we agree to, and thus we can't have a relationship? Um, how, do we, uh, how do we represent ourselves uh, to outsiders? And so, of course, there are good reasons on each side. Every side of these um, conflict situations is going to have good reasons. And the tension is going to play with us. Uh, it's going to mess with us. It's going to challenge us. Uh, but in the end, the Holy Spirit must be the one to guide us. Um, and so for the next uh, week here, uh, I just want to show you the homework that we're going to be working on, uh, reading Ezra chapter 7 through 10. And that's going to finish out the book of Ezra. Uh, and really going through an entire book of the Bible, uh, basically within three weeks, that's that's... That's good. Of course, I said we're going through it quickly. Uh, I know the video hasn't really gone by quick, but there's a lot more that we could have spent time on uh, thinking about today. But we have done, we've certainly given it uh, uh, due diligence in our, in our uh, study of these few chapters. <clears throat> so we will continue uh, within the second of these three main stories uh, next week. We'll be introduced to Ezra himself. Uh, yes, there is an Ezra in the book of Ezra, as we talked about. He comes up in uh, chapter 7. Uh, we'll find out what they're going to be rebuilding next week and uh, what opposition is going to be coming their way and what kind of like anticlimax we're going to have uh, at the end of it. Because, yeah, th that story is going to very much echo uh, the one that we talked about today, and so is the third one uh, before we get to the end of the book. And so, again, if you have questions or responses to the questions that, uh, that I have posed uh, during our time together, you can certainly uh, email me, pastormatthew at zlcbrentwood.org. I would welcome the discussion and the opportunity to think about these questions with you. Uh, but in the meantime, as uh, we prepare to, uh, uh, to say goodbye for this week, I just want to offer the, the blessing I always do. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Very well. God's peace to you all, and we'll see you all next time.